Um, Rusty, I swear. <laughs> um, I've had several people ask, uh, I've done this, uh, both of these demos before, and I've had a couple of people ask about them recently. So I'm going to go over a little bit of the hairspray chipping and a little bit of rust on this 20-foot uh, container. Um, I'll pass this around. This is actually a, the, I didn't actually paint this. This is from uh, Adam Wilder did a demo on rust at the uh, AMPS. 2013 national, so I'll pass that around so you can kind of see uh, what's going on. Um, oh, also, before I forget, if anybody does a, de a demo, is wanting to do a demo that requires an airbrush and they don't want to bring their, if they've got a big compressor or whatever and you need a compressor, the club has a compressor. What you, is that? Uh, it's set. I mean, it's not. It has basically three speeds of. Okay. But for something like this, it right. it does okay. Um, so if anybody wants to do a demo or something and doesn't want to bring their own compressor, the club has a compressor for you to use. Is it kept here? Uh, no, just just request it. I mean, we can leave it here, uh, but uh, I don't want to walk off. So. Right. It usually stays with the show stuff. Right. So anyway, uh, what I've got here, this is a 20 foot shipping. Well, it's most of a 20 foot shipping container. Um, and I figure I'd do this because it's kind of a neutral object. Um, and the other thing, I'm going to do all the, the rust stuff. You notice I don't have any of the, the AK or ammo or MIG product. I don't have any of that pre-made products up here. It's, this is all just just paint. Um, and I did that for a reason because the last couple times I've done this, I've leaned heavy towards um, the pre-mixed products. And those things can be kind of expensive and they're really not that necessary. So uh, I'm going to do this with just plain acrylic paint. So what I did uh, last night, I shot a coat of red primer on this, and then I went in and did some dark uh, airbrushing, just as kind of an undertone for some of the rust. I'm not going to paint this entire thing, but I'm, I'll give you a, an idea what's going on. The first thing I'm going to do is the hairspray chipping method. This came out um, in probably 10 years ago now, eight, nine years ago. Uh, Phil Stazinskis came up with this. Basically, it uses hairspray as a barrier between paint layers. You put down your base coat, you spray this on, you let it dry for a second, you put another acrylic paint on top of it, and then when you get it wet, it starts to dissolve the hairspray. It breaks apart, and it chips the paint off. Uh, before I get into that, uh, the, there is certain kinds of paint. Tamiya paint works the best over it, hands down. Uh, there's always uh, someone trying to reinvent the wheel, so there's a lot of articles on people using Vallejo's and stuff like that, but categorically, nothing works better than uh, Tamiya does. Um, and that's because of the kind of paint it is. It's not a, not a true acrylic, it's actually a lacquer that happens to be water soluble. Um, Vallejo paints are a vinyl acrylic. When they dry, they make a hard shell over the whole thing. So when, and I'll, I'll show you what happens. When it starts to break up, it comes off in big sheets instead of little bit pieces. Um, so, and life color is kind of somewhere in between. Uh, the brand of hairspray is not, uh, doesn't matter. This is Tresemme, this is what I've always used. Um, and it works, it works well, it's predictable. So that's what I, that's what I use. Um, the co color that I've mixed is like a light blue and it's thin with water. You don't want to thin it with real, I mean, you can thin it with other stuff, but water works the best because this is all kind of dependent on water. Um, brushes. You'll need an uh, assortment of different tools and brushes to do this. Um, my favorite brush for doing the chipping part of it is this old ratty, cheap brush from uh, is it Walmart or Hobby Lobby, I don't remember. Uh, kind of the stumpier and crappier it is, the better it works. Uh, you can also use uh, skewers and things like that to kind of do some scratches, and I'll show some of that on there. Uh, softer brushes will give you a little bit different effect. Um, so, I'll, and I'll show you all of that right, right now. All right, this is going to get a little stinky. Just a second. And you don't need a whole lot, a couple of light coats. Dry this with a hairbrush, or a hairbrush, hair dryer, and then put another one on. And one thing that I people are so paranoid about this stuff over drying and it not working, not true. I put this stuff on. Put paint on it, worked on it, came back two months later, and it will reactivate. You can keep working with it. So the, this business about it over drying is really not, not true. There's a, 
Is your probably, base coat acrylic or enamel? It's acrylic. Uh, I'm not gonna. It's dry overnight. It's not. Gonna be uh, if you can do either one. It doesn't really matter. And you can put a clear coat on it if you choose. It's, it's really not that not that big a deal. Um, there are some products out there. Uh, some premix. It's kind of funny because hairspray is premix too. But there's some pre-made, pre-sold products that are for chipping, and really all it is is bottled hairspray. <laughs> And it's a lot more expensive. Um, I mean, a bottle like this big costs like eight bucks, and this is like a dollar. Yeah. And they yeah, do the same thing. Well, and you can spray this through the airbrush. It's not talking about they want you to spray. It yeah, they want you to spray through the airbrush. But you can spray this through the airbrush. He can't, yeah, you can't, or you can get the kind that's in a pump spray and just pour it in the airbrush. Um, again, it's it's one of those things. Airbrushing. I mean, it has its airbrushing. It can if you're if you're getting really specific in areas, you know, airbrushing it is okay. But for what our purposes here today, I'm just gonna. So it'll leave like a thick chill finish. Yeah, it's got there. that's that's it's dry. I mean, it's got kind of a uh, semi gloss, which when you do all the stuff with water, it'll come off. It'll be flat when it's dry. So, and the other thing is the density of the paint. And I'll show you this: the density of the paint uh, has a huge. Uh, effect on the, the final look of it. So, huh? I did clean it up. <laughs> so I had to clean it, make sure the needle wasn't stuck in it before I got here. That would have been embarrassing. All right. So again, this is just uh, Tamiya paint, thin with uh, water. This is going to take me a minute, and I'm going to do some some thicker areas and some thinner areas, especially down here where I was going to do the rust stuff. I'm going to make it a little thinner so that it shows through. The main thing you don't want to do when you're spraying it like this, and I'll, I'll see if it'll do it, you don't want to get down here and do that with it because you're getting it so wet that the hairspray will start to dissolve from the dampness and paint and it'll start crackling. It'll look like a dry desert mud. Um, doesn't do it every time, but more often than not. So I'm keeping it up, keeping that kind of a dry coat and it's taking a few minutes to get the coverage on it, but that's okay. Um, any questions so far? Several thin coats to keep it from getting too wet. Because, well, you can see it right here. Starting to crack. Yeah, it's starting to crack on the end right there, just from the dampness of the paint. So you want to keep the paint uh, thin and dry when it's going on. You can always put more coats on it. It's not going to matter how many coats of paint on it. Um, the guy that did that, that demo piece right there, he did a, a build one time that by the time it was done, it had probably 30 coats of paint and hairspray on it. On, it was a bare metal uh, tank. And it probably had 30 coats of hairspray and, and uh, paint on it. And it looked just fine. And the mixture on my paint here is certainly not ideal, but it's. Yeah, and it's, it's thick. I got it a little bit too thick. But anyway, that right there will give us give us what we need. Do one second to clean this. Um, anybody got any questions real quick while I clean this? So you so you would do one layer, you want to do another layer, would you spray it with gel coat or something to protect that layer? You can. Um, if you're doing multiple layers of hairspray and paint, it's probably not a bad idea to throw a, a clear coat of some sort on there, but it's not entirely um, uh, necessary. Uh, the good thing about it is, is this stuff, um, paint thinner, like if you're doing, a, if you're doing a, 
washes and stuff like that, paint there has absolutely no effect on it. It's not the fact that it's wet, it's the fact that it's water. Right. Hairspray is not soluble by paint thinner. Right. I mean, I can take this thing and dunk it in paint there and nothing will happen. So, that's good for guys who, who weather a lot. Then you don't have to do anything over the top of it as far as that goes. All right. So, they can see how it's cracked. The top color's cracked from getting it too wet. Mm. Yeah, and that's a common mistake. Huh? It's cool effect if you need it, but it's really hard to cover up if you don't. Mm -hmm. Believe me, because the first time I did this, I messed it up, and I got another spot on the side right there. Um, it can have its use, like if you're doing a, like cracked wood, like old wood or something like right. that. You can do it on purpose if, you, if you're confident enough to do it on purpose and it look right. Um, but there's other things out there that are just as good uh, to do that. All right, so I got a little bit of water here. It doesn't have to be warm. But it's, just, it's just water. And I'm just gonna get it. It takes a little bit of I'm trying to make it so everybody can and I probably didn't let this uh, top coat dry long enough, but um, but you get the idea. Correct. And it's lifting it because it's dissolving the layer that's underneath it. It's not dissolving the paint on top, it's dissolving that barrier that's underneath it. Um, the other thing that you want, you most certainly want to do um, is, especially when you're doing a light color, is you want to, um, there's a, a slurry forms on it when it starts to, to dissolve it, you start getting in this case a blue slurry um, but if you're doing like one time I did a, a camouflage that had a black in it and I, when I chipped the black it turned it like it made it really dark so I had to constantly clean that that black slurry off of it and the softer brush it is the, uh, the softer the effect is going to be and this uh, this is really uh, really crude but you're getting the idea of what's going on um, the other thing is, is you can take like something like this, like on these shipping containers, you see a lot of um, longitudinal scratches and things like that. Um, like I said, uh, and then just do something top here. This had a little bit more time to dry. Uh, normally, I would spray this stuff and then wait for an hour or so before I start messing with it uh, to give the paint a chance to dry. So, you got, see, and this is, now, all right, now you can see it's a little bit more, you're starting to get some like really small pieces come off, which is really what you want. You don't want these big, huge pieces come off unless you're doing something that's just really, really rusted out. But then you can go along the edges with a sharp instrument. Kind of chip up the paint. Again, you can put uh, scratches in it, um, and then you can actually take those scratches and kind of enlarge them because it opens up a place where the water can get in a little easier. You got that bingo. The scale of it is the thing that you really got to work with, and that's what takes the practice. Doing the actual technique is easy. Getting the scale of the, the scratches, the chips, and things like that is really. That one over there looks like it might have been a little bit. Oh yeah, this is definitely out of scale over here because the paint was just extremely fresh. This sat for a little bit, and the paint hardened up. Like I said, ideally, I would take this, spray it, and then leave it sit for an hour before I came back to it. Um, but I don't think y'all want to do that. So you got to, now you can tell it takes a little bit more scrubbing to get the stuff to come loose, which is what you want. Is this, uh, you want to have to work at it a little bit. 
but you don't want to have, if you're sitting there and you have to do this with it, you didn't put enough of the hairspray on it. All right, so you might have questions on that? It's just practice. I mean, it's really easy, um, but it's just it's just practice. Um, one of the stiffer brushes. All right. Basically, what a stiffer brush will do, it just takes, it starts. And another thing you can do instead of dragging it, you can stipple it. And you get an even different different effect on it just by stippling it. This is a uh, stencil brush. Um, they're really coarse and really uh, stiff. Uh, so uh, stippling it. Is that water in your typical brush? Yes, it's just water, just plain, plain tap water. You said you to be a fine. With water, yeah. Would it be less likely to crack if you were going to yeah. It's possible. Um, I know people who have done enamels over this, doing this method. I know people have done a lot of different things, but I personally haven't done it. And I'm going to tell you. I'm just telling you what my experience is. So enamel is just you have to, No, you do it with you have to you do it with water because it's not the paint that's dissolving. It's the barrier underneath it. So right. There's spray dissolving. It's not the paint. So you could technically do it. Enamels over the top of it. As long as the water will get through it, that's the key to it. The water's got to get through it. I was just wondering, if water might be something that is It is. It is. The water so in the paint is. Maybe not. But it would take. It, it's that's it would be some experiment, and that's and that's great. You know. Uh, yeah, you could probably use alcohol. I didn't bring any with me. Um, but uh, but it would just be, you just have to experiment with it. Um, if you want to see what happens when you scrub like this. This area is down here cracked. I mean, you can, if you really want to do some just gnarly stuff. So I mean, different pressures, different brushes, different. I mean, it's there's a bazillion different techniques for doing. And when I when I get ready to do this shipping container for real, because I'm gonna go home, I'm gonna soak this thing in something and get all this off because I didn't finish building it. Um, I'm gonna end up doing something like really heavy on it. Um, a lot of people um, use a salt technique for doing shipping. Uh, I don't have a problem with it, but it's not nearly as predictable as doing this. Because this is literally where you put your brush is where stuff's going to happen. The salt thing where you wet it and put salt on it and then you paint over it and you <coughs> knock it off, you really don't have much control over what happens in the end. Uh, all right, so let me uh, let me get this area down here prepped and we'll do some brush real quick. I'm just gonna scrub some of this back because I got a little more paint on it than I would have to. Now, the last model that I did a lot of this on, I spent quite a bit of time going really slowly around it. So I mean, it's it's a technique. It's easy to do, but it, it takes a, some practice and it takes some time to really keep it on, uh, in scale. All right. So, are you saying you don't do the rust on top of it? Yeah, just for just for demonstration's sake, I'm gonna do the rust on top of it. So far, I've been making this really nice blue color and then painting blue. You would be painting rust. Well, yes. If I had gone, gone, if I had, if I was painting this for real, I would have done. I would have painted it all rusty underneath it, and then put the paint. But I'm really showing you two different things right now. Uh, and I'll do so. I'll do that in a minute when I finish the rust. I'll throw the, the some more hairspray on it to show you what that looks like. Um, really, what I've got on here is just a, this red, and the, it's just another color of because you know shipping containers are all different colors and stuff. Um, but the uh, this dark color is I put down as kind of a base for the rust because it, it will work. 
pretty good. Um, all right, so I didn't bring a sponge. Um, all right. I forgot to bring a sponge. Um, Ron, do y'all have any packing sponges back there or packing foam? Peanuts. No, peanuts. I need yeah. like a sponge. I'm going to hook itself. Right. Yeah, just like foam like a electronics comes in. Um, all right, I'll just set the improvise. All right, so what I'm going to do here, this is all with acrylics. It's going to be pretty quick and dirty, especially since I don't have what I actually want. Hopefully this will work. Man, it's just, you talk about the rust part of it, or just in general? I look at a lot of pictures on there. When I'm bored at work, I'm looking at pictures of trains and tractors and shipping, anything that's, that's beat up or, um, or can give me a, or like old semi-trailers and things like that. Like I said, this is really not going to be, it's not doing a too bad a job. All right, so what I'm doing here is just stippling on some color. Uh, fairly dry. Just to get a basic uh, rust tone to start with. If you look, rust is one of those things you really need to check and look at references because different materials, you know, cast metal rust differently than, than sheet metal. Time, uh, temperature, uh, exposure to different heat or cold or things like that it really changes the, the uh, coloring and the makeup of rust. What I'm doing here is more like a just a surface mm -hmm. rust. What? Type of material. Yeah, like cast iron turns after a while. Cast iron turns almost purple. It turns really, really, really dark. Rust. If you just leave it out, it will turn almost a purplish color. Um, whereas sheet metal generally stays more towards the orange and red tones. So, no, it really d depends heavily on on what it is, um, and then again, also the makeup of of the metal. What it what with the chemical composition. And that's where references, going trolling around on the internet and looking at reference pictures is really important. Um, all right, so there's one color. And I'm gonna do several different colors and then I'm gonna do some uh, washes and glazes. And like that. All right, this is more of a dark kind of chocolate brown. This is just kind of the base, the base color. This is not going to be the finished uh, top uh, surface. It's going to be and some some heavier spots of it, that. Or I mean, it's just kind of what what looks good. Uh, typically, I would have a reference picture in front of me of whatever it is I was painting. Um, another one. I, I don't know what color, this is. Fire orange. It's just a really bright, and I'll use this more later, but just a really bright orange. Um, the age of rust, like, all right, you go out, for example, right in the morning before you go to work, and look at the brake room, the brake rover on your car. Because the day before when you got home, it was bright silver. You got there the next morning, it's going to be have surface rust on it that's like somewhere in that neighborhood, all over, just from the moisture in the air. Because it's kind of a new rust. Uh, and I got a buddy of mine who, who does a lot of rusted out models and stuff. He did a really good uh, thing on the uh, cast iron and how it turns just almost purple. And I've got some pictures. Uh, and, Alright, 
that's all we're going to do for the, the base color. That's this dry. That's a beautiful thing about those acrylics is they're, they're dry. All right, the next thing I'm going to do is some uh, um, in, in, in these painting circles, it's called mapping, but it, it's, it's basically like a thick glaze of paint that where you can do, uh, it's kind of opaque, but not completely. So what we're going to do is, yeah, not on this particular thing, what, what that guy was doing, he was doing, he was doing bare steel. This would, this is not bare steel so much as like his was like shiny steel that was rusted out. So there's a lot more to it. Than, and he had like 15 different, it was like the thing was made from all different pieces and stuff. So it was, it was a little bit different than what we're doing here. Um, basically what I'm doing in this, when I start doing this, it's a very fluid kind of thing. It's just these thin little blotches of color. For this, I like to use kind of a, this is a, I don't know what this is. It's a number two brush. It'll hold a little paint. You don't want like a little tiny brush for this. Uh, you need a fairly soft brush for this. That, that first, the, the, the other part I was doing, normally I do with uh, sponges, different kinds of sponges. I completely forgot to bring them. And you see this, <coughs> this is adding in some of the more solid uh, pieces of uh, the more solid coverage areas of the rest. And you can go back, you only got a second before it starts to dry, but um, then go in and start kind of jacking around with it. And one of the things I'll show you in a second is how surf a lot of the material, especially like if you got, okay, this container almost looks like it caught on fire down here or had a fire and burned the paint back on it. I'll show you in a second. Well, I can show you right now. If you take like this kind of medium orangey color, and I did a project like this uh, a few years ago. Uh, just a second, I'll flip it over so you can see it. Um, a lot of times, the paint, the rust will start coming through the paint from underneath it. You, you ever seen like an old car hood or something like that where it has like the rust that's coming up from underneath it? You can do that with this by just putting thin layers of paint on it. And I'll do a little bit more here in a second, but it's, um, but you're kind of getting the, it's like this part is really bad, and then the, the moisture stuff got up underneath the paint and it's starting to bleed through the paint on the other side. Uh, all right, let me. Uh, I know I'm blowing through this really fast, but it's. Uh, uh, and I would be delighted if anybody really wants to delve into this really uh, deep. I'm more than happy to do it. Do some tutelage or something like that with it. More than happy, but it's just it's too long of a process to to really do everything in one city. Um, throw in some more of a reddish color. And I'm not being too, too precise with this because there's there's not much uh, rhyme or reason to it a lot of times. It's all about just layer upon layer upon layer upon layer because when you're looking at rust and stuff, you want to see there's depth to it, you know, there's this color, and it started out as this color, and it turned this color, and it turned this color, and this turned this color. Um, all right, kind of the, the final step that I'm gonna do is uh, kind of a speckling technique, um, and it adds all the little points, the little tiny dots of, of color. Uh, and I'm gonna use this, uh, this is that stencil brush again, and this gets really messy, I highly suggest you uh, check what's in the background. And basically what this is just a mouse to. Some people use their finger, you can do that. I like using something that doesn't. Yeah. And you're literally just actually 
All right, just, just so you, you look at before I do the thing. And then now I'm up. Before I start doing the kind of speckling, and I'm going to prop this up so I can get it on absolutely every time. And I'll go ahead and use my finger. Then we'll do a couple of different colors on this. And all I'm doing is this. Generally, I like to use a, that, a skewer to do this, but, it, but it's a little slower and a little bit more deliberate in the interest of time I'm doing it. And the more, yeah, a little bit. And if you're quick about it, if you get it a little thick, you get some dots a little big or something, you can get them with some water and kind of melt them in. This is extremely messy, but it's actually pretty gratifying to, to paint something. This is the kind of stuff that I like to paint. And this is really, really applicable to pretty much any genre of hobby. I mean, from like Rusty doing his Frankenstein. When you're doing your Frankenstein stuff, like this is this is applicable for your figure painting stuff as much as it is. What's that? The Rust stuff is, oh, is yeah. applicable for any. Yeah, I did that on a figure. That's exactly what I'm doing here. I'm literally exactly what I'm doing here. Um, and you'll be able to see these little speckles and stuff like that. And, and, uh, it is scary. And, it's, and doing this technique is about paint consistency, how much you have on your brush. I mean, it's, there's a lot of factors on what kind of brush you have. Yeah. Like I said, if I was doing this on my own, I would be checking it, but I'm making a horrible mess on y'all's behalf. All right, there's the speckling stuff. As you see the little dots and different colors and things like that. Uh, it's kind of a quick and dirty uh, technique that works pretty good. You know, this is rust. I'm trying to rust. Yeah, a yeah. similar approach for Yes. Yeah, I, I use the same technique for doing just uh, when I'm doing the regular paint job. It has the same tech, but maybe mud colors or maybe slightly different colors of paint, base paint color. I mean, there's, I use this uh, kind of spec, and Rusty actually taught me this thing. Uh, doing this uh, speckling stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he actually taught me this. Um, all right, the last thing I want to show you, and this kind of adds some cool, just coolness factor. It's not really applicable on this, but if you had some flat plate, no, have it where you've got another plate sitting on it. All right, so I just took some tape and put it down in a corner like that. This paint, normally I would probably do this with airbrush, but. So all I did was just put a little, a little bit of paint kind of glazed in the corner. I said typically I would do this with an airbrush, but that's the kind of thing. You get the look of that's a, 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 another piece of plate was laying on top of it. And the rust bled off of it. Like they had thrown a piece of sheet metal up there. Yeah, that'd be perfect if you're doing works. Right. And this is also, um, would also be like, a, if I was putting markings on the side of this container that were really old, I would do them like that, where they were, you know, just really um, uh, plain. But that's that's it. That's the that's the finished thing. Like I said, that's a really quick and dirty version of it, but that's pretty much the gist of it.
But like I said, if anybody really wants to delve into it, just uh, get a hold of me and we'll try and work out a time and we'll do some just a little bit deeper. Um, Camouflage. That's that's the entire difference. Yeah, but I would, but I treat generally when I do camouflage, I treat them the same way. What's that? Uh, the the hair, hair spray between the camouflage colors, so I can chip them up. Uh, I mean, it's not the aircraft. Even on aircraft, I'd build an aircraft right now and use the hairspray on the aircraft to help add some more busyness to the paint. Right. I would reduce it maybe to 70. That's all. I mean, that's 75, 25. There's a lot of stuff you can do with it. It's, it's a lot of experimenting, a lot of practice. It's not hard. It's just something you want to fiddle around with before you admit it to a practice, practice, practice. Some of the colors, I don't know, for whatever reason, it, uh, it uh, didn't mesh with the alcohol. That's all I got. Unless anybody's got any questions. Okay. All right. Let's rig.